All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Friar Focus. I'm Father Frank Savola, coming to you from St. Anthony's Shrine in downtown Crossing, Boston, Massachusetts. It's good to be with you. Here again uh, from the Shrine, I, we have uh, Brother Paul Burke with us. Brother Paul is one of the friars here at St. Anthony's. Now, one of the things that is going to happen over the next few weeks, if I have my, if I have the schedule right in my head, <clears throat> is that we are going to be talking for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking to friars born in Massachusetts. Ooh. Yeah, that's kind of the way it lined up. Uh, lined up. So uh, we'll have a few friars here. So we'll talk a little bit about being close to home. Um, but Brother Paul, welcome to, uh, Thank you. Welcome to our show. Thank good you very much. Good to have you with us. Nice to be here. So Paul, uh, you know, people see you around the shrine, yes. especially on Sundays. And well, every, every day you're around and about. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? All How right. you join the friars? All, All right. right. I'll be happy to, Frank. Uh, I, uh, my name is Paul Burke. Uh, French-Canadian. Uh, I was born not too far from here in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, the youngest of three. I have uh, an older sister and an older, older brother. And um, I think if I talk about my vocation to the friars or even to uh, being a, a Roman Catholic, I think it started when I was very, very young. We had a parish church at home, a beautiful church, which I visited just the other day, called St. Anthony of Padua. Mm. But we always refer, it was a French church, so we always refer to it as St. Antoine. We refer to the school as St. Anthony, but we always refer to the church as St. Antoine. So when I was just a baby, maybe one years old, they hired some French painters to come into St. Antoine to paint the murals on the walls. And my mom would bring me to the church and sit there and with me in her arms and uh, would watch the painters painting. And in the front of the church, there was a beautiful statue of St. Anthony uh, kneeling down in a Franciscan habit. So I'm just wondering if all of that didn't sort of feed into my uh, religious feelings as I was growing up and go going to this church. Um, my dad... Uh, when I was probably third or fourth grade, my dad uh, said to the family that he would be going to uh, morning mass every day during Lent. And if any of us wanted to join him, just let him know the night before and he would wake us up and we could go with him. Uh, you know, it was purely uh, free. I mean, you could go if you wanted or not. He, he wouldn't mind or he didn't mind. So sometimes I would go to church with him in the morning and I remember walking up the church to the church from, from our home, which is probably from here to Primark, very, very close. And my little hand would be in his big hand, and it just felt so safe. And I remember thinking to myself, if God is my father and God is like this guy, my dad, I'm in good shape. So we'd go to church in the morning, and at that time, uh, they don't do this anymore, but at that time it was called the Worker's Mass. And uh, Father Dantremont, who was the pastor, would come out in a beautifully white, starched surplus and his cassock, kneel down in front of this beautiful tabernacle, open up the tabernacle, take the ciborium out, and give out communion to the people who couldn't stay for the Mass. Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, he would go into the sacristy and, uh, you know, vest for Mass, and my dad and I would stay there. Now, when I was growing up, people would ask, you know, is your father, is your family very religious? And we didn't think we were. My brother and sister and I didn't think we were particularly religious. But as you hear stories from other families, you begin to think, well, maybe the, you know, the idea that your home is your first church really right. has some validity here. So I remember when I was not a teenager yet. My brother and sister were teenagers, and they loved to dance. We all did. We all loved to dance. And they would go to Friday night dances at St. Killian's. My sister would come downstairs in her, in her poodle skirt with all her petticoats, and my brother would have his hair cut in a DA, <laughs> ready to go out Friday night, going to the dances. In the month of October, nobody left the house until we said the family rosary, which I thought was just kind of normal. And then, you know, you talk to your friends and they think, wow, you know, but that's kind of strange. You know, we don't do that in my house. And then when I was in high school, uh, the Franciscans moved to New Bedford mm -hmm. and we had a chapel there. And I got, I didn't really get to know a lot of the friars. To me, they seemed so happy. When I saw them in the chapel working and, and, and in confession, they were lovely in confession, 
They just seemed like such a happy group of men. And eventually I had the nerve to make an acquaintance in the in the chapel with uh, Brother Bonaventure Hinchliffe. I don't know if you know him or uh, not. I don't remember him. Big, big, tall, Ichabod Crane kind of character. Bushy, bushy eyebrows and the nicest personality. So he introduced me to the friars in, in the friary. And that's when I started really thinking about, you know, maybe joining the friars and eventually did. Mm-hmm. It was really it, it, the best decision of my life. I have to say that. The day that I entered St. Stephen's Monastery in Krogan, New York. We hadn't gotten out of the car yet, my mom and dad and I, and I fell in love with the place. That's great. It was just, you know when you made the right decision, you know it's the right thing for you? That's how it's been like since day one. That's great. It's been a wonderful life. Yeah, it really has. wonderful. Yeah, thanks. When you just told that little story about your mom holding you while you bought yeah, the church, yeah. I thought maybe you were going to tell us that you and you and your mom ended up as a painting of the Blessed Mother and the Baby <laughs> Jesus. Wouldn't that you know? be something? Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. oftentimes artists will use real yeah. contemporary people to paint those. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll have to check those paintings a little closer. <laughs> check those paintings maybe a little closer. I'm in a maybe, it's you and your, maybe it's you and your mom in that painting. You never know. You never know. So that was really nice. Yeah. That's a great story. That's, yeah. a, that's a really nice uh, yeah. location story. Yeah, it was. It really was. So you went into the, you went into the Brothers uh, Formation. Program. I did. Program. I went into the Brothers yeah. Formation Program right at the time when Vatican II was happening. And uh, actually, when I joined the Friars, I thought the life would be uh, uh, quieter. Yeah. Uh, a lot of guys will ask me, uh, well, why didn't you become a priest? You know, why did you become a brother and not become a priest? And really, the really honest answer from my heart is I really wanted a quieter life. Mm-hmm. I figured I'd live in a monastery, work in a monastery, and it would just be simple. Then Vatican II came along, and all of a sudden we we're given the opportunity to go to college. And I thought, that's wonderful. I'm going to do that. So I, I went to Merrimack College. I got my degree in, in psych. And then I uh, went to the uh, WTU and got mm-hmm. my degree in, in, in uh, theology. And then started teaching and taught for like 36 years. Yeah. And I loved teaching. It was a wonderful way to spend a day. High school with teenagers, which was great, which was great. They were very funny, very funny group of pe- uh, people to teach. Uh, I taught in an all-boys school, which was Timon in, Timon Buffalo, in Buffalo, which was lovely. And then I taught in a, an African-American school in Patterson, New Jersey. And then I taught in an all-girls academy in New Jersey. And then I taught in a, a co-ed school in, in Taunton. Uh, and at that time, uh, my mom and dad were getting pretty old and feeble, and that's why I moved back from New Jersey to Massachusetts to uh, kind of be closer to them, not mm-hmm. live with them. We had a summer house. I was living in our summer house, but to be closer to them and kind of take care of them at night when I came home from school. But then eventually, they just became too... Uh, they weren't able to be alone, so I quit teaching uh, took care of them uh, as their full-time caretaker for about seven years, and we sold the summer house so that I'd have money to be able to live on. And that, I feel that I was being prepared to do that, uh, to be a caretaker for my folks almost from the time that I was a novice. It just seemed like, you know how you, it's the right thing to do at the right time? So that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, and Things happened there that I, I never would have expected. For example, the, at one point, the, uh, the staff that would come in once or twice a week to take, you know, look over things yeah. and, and give me a chance to go out and do some food shopping and things like that ended. It just stopped. And I said to them, well, what do I do now? And they said, well, <laughs> you're kind of on your own, so good luck. Okay, okay, so I was now, my dad had passed, and now I was a full-time caretaker for my mom. And one of the experiences that we both had to go through was uh, washing her, you know. And that, my mom is a French woman, and, and as most mothers would be with their sons, very modest. So we did this very slowly over a period of time. And, and at one point, uh, we were both getting comfortable with it. And washing her, washing her body was like wash, was, was washing the first home I had ever had. And it really became a sacramental act. I really, mm, really nice. loved taking care of her. And then when she passed, uh, uh, I, I moved in here mm-hmm. to, to uh, St. Anthony's Shrine. A wonderful place to live. A, a wonderful community. We are a wonderful community of men living together. 26 of us, and it's really, really a nice place to live and work. Yes, it is. Yeah. So you moved here. You moved here five years ago, the same yeah. time I moved here. Yeah, yeah. We moved in at the same time. Yeah. 
And you have found your way here. You, you have a number of different things going on here. I do, yeah. Tell us a little bit about... Uh, well, um, I, I, I'm working in the booth right now downstairs in the lobby, which is really nice on, on Tuesdays. And uh, I'm working in the food bank uh, with uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, when COVID hit us, it closed us down a lot longer than we expected. I remember when we first closed, I'm sure you remember this too, Frank, we were going to be closed for a month. Mm -hmm. We thought Tops. we'd be closed for a month and then we'd open up. And it went longer and longer than that. Over a year we were closed. So at the beginning of the COVID, when we realized as a country that this was not going to go away, our provincial father, Kevin Mullen, sent around on video uh, well, a number of videos about us living together and living closer and, you know, being careful and what it's going to be like because you're going to be kind of walking on top of each other for a while. And he sent out three videos from three psychologists and they were saying things like, at nighttime, have something to do as a community. So that's when I got into the idea of maybe we'd start using our rec room at night for mm -hmm. movies. So we have like movie night during the week with freshly popped popcorn, <laughs> butter, and salt, except for the diabetics, that's going to be plain. <laughs> and it, it's gone over rather well. We've, oh, yeah. we've enjoyed it's it. Awesome. We've seen a lot of nice movies in the house. And it, it, it's an option. It's an option that if guys want to use it or take advantage of it at night, it's there to take advantage of. And it's been very nice. And I have to say, for all the movies that we've shown in like three years, I've never watched a movie once alone. There's yeah. always been somebody there. So that's been a nice... And, and guys like Father Michael Johnson remember saying to me, this is like a ministry, a house ministry. It's like a, 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 you're doing something for someone else and trying to bring some pleasure into it. Oh, sure. It's, so it's a really nice. important thing. Friars really yeah, enjoy nice. it. You know, friars, so. they, don't always, no. they don't always express it. No, but, uh, no, we don't. I, I can tell you for sure that friars enjoy it and good. are grateful for it. And, good, good. Uh, Chat about it. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, I'm to, glad to with, hear yeah, that. Yeah, for, for yeah. Friars, yeah. And if somebody's birthday's coming up, we have a nice celebration yeah. with birthdays. Father Hugh just had a 90th birthday. We had a nice big party for him with balloons everywhere. It was fun. Yeah, a couple fun years ago, I asked Paul to uh, sort of sort of head up a, a, yes. a recreation party committee in the yes. house, and he's done a great job. Yeah, yeah. It's hardly, fun. hardly, a, hardly an event goes by. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The most obscure <laughs> holidays. <laughs> You can walk into the rec room and find balloons uh, <laughs> and banners. It's yeah, great. Yeah, but yeah. now tell us about tell us about your knitting and your painting and your well, Sunday morning ministry. Well, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I certainly didn't look to, to become a knitter. Uh, that just kind of fell in, into my life. Uh, I had a cousin who was living in New Jersey at the time. She had moved here from Oregon with her husband. She had had some serious surgery. So when I was visiting her uh, in her apartment in New Jersey, in Rawa, New Jersey. She said to me, you know, I'm so sick of talking about my illnesses. Let me show you how to knit. She says, I showed George, my, her husband, how to knit. And he knit a scarf, and man, he didn't want to do it anymore. So she showed me how, you know, and I, I let her do it because it was something to take her mind off her pain. And she said, God, I think you're a natural at this. You're, you're, this is really, really nice. So... She fed into my vanity. So I started learning. I took a couple of classes. I took a couple of, I bought some videos. And yeah, and then I ended up doing, I made things for my dad, for my mom. It was nice. It's a nice hobby. And, and, and there, can I just show you something? Yeah. There, there's a, if anybody out there is a knitter and you enjoy history, this book is called The History of Hand Knitting. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It was written by a bishop. Uh, the Bishop of Leicester, Richard Rutt, and it's really quite a very, very interesting book if you're uh, so inclined. Um, and let me just show you, this is, no, if you like knitting and you like fabric construction, this is great. If you don't like it, I'd go away, go get a cup of coffee, come back in a minute, <laughs> and you don't have to listen to this. But this is, a, this is what's called a fair isle, and it, it looks really, really complicated to make. And uh, there are a lot of knitters who have knit for years who are afraid of using, of knitting with two colors. And the difficulty of this, if there is one, is that you have to, if you're a knitter, you know how you knit with one hand and you push the yarn up and you knit. This you've got to knit with both hands. Uh -huh. So you've got to have a, a yarns in both hands. And what happens is, if you are a knitter, you know that you have to look at the inside of the garment. This is really what tells you whether or not you're really a good knitter or not, depending on how your floats look. So this is what's called a fair isle, and it's a really, really nice design. Actually, it's one of my very favorite, uh, favorite uh, yeah. items. Yeah, and really, it only takes, believe it or not, it only takes two colors per per row. 
even though it looks like there's a lot yeah, more in there. Yeah. It's a, if it. Oh, I shouldn't talk about. It. I don't see the camera. That's right. You That's can okay. Talk. You can talk. About okay. It. Okay. If you're looking for something relaxing and uh, kind of a very meditative kind of uh, an experience, knitting is really really nice. And in this book of the history of hand knitting, there are four archbishops of Canterbury who had their at different times, of course, who who taught their children how to knit because they said it was a way in which they could quiet down, be reflective, and think about things in the world without watching television all the time. Yeah, you know, or, yeah. or, and then another piece here, this is, a, this is a Swedish hat. This is called a Dubelmosa, and this is very popular in Sweden. And uh, it's a really nice design done by Meg Swanson. If you're a knitter, you probably know Meg Swanson. And what you do is you would take the hat and you just push it up, and then you have... You get it to a line where it's kind of straight, and then you flip it up, and you wear it like that. Oh, and you've got four, four levels of warmth to keep your eye, your your ears uh, covered and nice and warm. So that was fun. Those are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy. Yeah, I enjoy doing that. I have a great appreciation for knitting, and I love watch, looking at your stuff on Sundays because my grandmother was a great knitter. Oh. Yeah. I, actually, oh. in my room, I still have two afghans she made me. Oh, man. One she made me when I was a little boy, mm. and I still have it, and another one she made me when I went to college, and I, I, still, have, I still have both of them. They're that beautiful. is great. And she made us, oh, she made us scarves and, 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 and hats and little booty slippers and, all the time, she was always knitting us stuff, and uh, I have those two afghans, and they're, they're really precious to me. They're in the heirlooms. Yeah, they're those beautiful. are really heirlooms. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a friend of mine called me, an ex friar called me the other day and told me that his niece is going to the college that I went to, Merrimack. Merrimack. And uh, would I be able to maybe knit her a scarf in the school colors, but make it a little bit different, you know, so that it won't be like everybody else's? So I just ordered some yarn uh, from Northampton, Massachusetts a company called Webbs, and uh, I'm looking forward to it coming in and, and start making her kind oh, good. of a unique. What I'd like to do is put her name in it. Uh -huh. That would be really nice, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, one of the things that I, I did when I was taking care of my mom, when I could, I was still working at the time, so it, it was easier for me to, you know, leave the house and leave her, and, and you know, she was, she was able to be ambulatory and cook for herself and all. And after my, pa my dad passed away, and it was just my mom and I living together, and that had never happened before. I had never lived with just my mom. I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. So I said to myself, I'm going to take a class. I'm going to take a class in something somewhere, because we have the University of Massachusetts, was right up the street in North Dartmouth. But I didn't want to take a class that had a lot of homework, because I was teaching all day. I had the papers to correct and all that, and classes to prepare. So I saw this in Michael's. Uh, arts and crafts store where you could take a class in cake decorating $25 for classes so I did and then again kind of like the knitting I got a little crazy with it I started taking more classes and I started taking some uh, uh, I, I bought videos and and uh, I was fortunate enough that I didn't live too far away from a school a local college that was uh, offering a cake decorating competition I said, well, what, what have I got to lose? I'm going to try. I'm going to try, uh, try my hand at competing in this lovely art form. And uh, so I entered uh, seven, seven different uh, contests over seven different years and was able to win first prize five times. So wow. that made me feel good. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's showing pictures yeah, now of some yeah. of the cakes, but that was fun. That's great. That was fun to do. Yeah, that's great. You have, you have a real artistic flair. I guess I do. Yeah, to, uh, I guess so. And you do some painting. I do. Yeah, yeah. We'll try to <laughs> our, our director. We're still on cakes over here. Try to put <laughs> one of the paintings <laughs> in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't please don't show them all. Uh, yeah, the painting was something that happened over COVID, uh, with us being again sequestered in the house. I thought, well, let me do something, and this is what came up in my head. I used to do them uh, when I was a kid, and uh, the quality of paint-by-number kits right now, I like to call them pre-designed, are just magnificent. Uh, he's showing you one now. Mark is showing you a picture now. It was originally done by a French artist by the name of Bougereau, but it's Mary and uh, the angels behind her. Um, 
what happened was like uh, religious painting was very popular in the you know 12th, 13th, 14th century. But in the 14th century, they began to deal with the Holy Family in a more humanistic, emotional way. So you have uh, two Italian brothers, Ambrogio and Pietro Lorenzetti, who lived mm, 1330, maybe to 1360, uh, 1350, I'm sorry. And uh, they did um, a group of paintings with Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, not sitting in a, in a, in a, on a throne, not sitting on a, on a chair. She's actually sitting on the floor. Jesus is in front of her. He's sitting next to St. Joseph, and she's knitting. Hmm. It's wow. called the Knitting Madonna. She's knitting on four I've needles, yeah. and it's a violet. And if you get a chance to, to see it, the name of the, the painter is Ambrogio Lorenzetti. Uh, we think the two brothers died, uh, Sien- it was, they were in Siena, Italy, and in 1348, the Black Plague came and really decimated Siena, and we think the Lorenzetti brothers may have died from the, from the Black Plague. But when you start looking at anything, it, knitting, all of a sudden I found knitting Madonnas, I didn't even know they existed, That's these incredible. paintings. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, it was fun, it was fun. So stop by the shrine any Sunday, and you'll see you can see Brother Paul's Absolutely. wares. Absolutely, please, please come. Um, yeah, he uh, he has a, he has a little table set up with some I do. things and for I, sale. I would like to just I found this one sentence prayer, and I would just like to say it for anybody who's out there who's a caregiver, taking care of uh, your mom or your dad, grandparent, and it's a it's a very short prayer, and it says, "Give me a quiet place to rest when I need it." and a quieting of my anxieties when I'm there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> hey, thanks, Paul. You know, we always end on a prayer, Good. so maybe that'll be our prayer okay. that we end on. Okay, all right, all right, excellent. Um, this is great. Thank Time you. Time flew by, Thank as you. I knew it would with you. I can't believe it's going to <laughs> This is great. <laughs> this is great is right. Yeah. So it's Brother Paul Burke. Stop by the shrine on, on a Sunday, or a Tuesday or Thursday. Uh, sure, no, what day are you in Tuesdays. The Tuesdays in, in the, the information booth. Uh, Come and say hello. On the first, uh, in the lobby. Sunday's in the lobby as well. He's across from Brother Sebastian, who's uh, who we had on a, a number of weeks ago with his wares. Yes, yes. And uh, that's great. So, Paul, thank you very You're much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Everyone, thanks once again for being with us. Don't forget, we are at Shrine Boston on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button. The more you subscribe, the more people we reach. So thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week, and God bless.